Are you involved in a business or thinking about starting one? Do you know there may be environmental impacts from business activities? According to the Environmental Protection Act of 1996, businesses such as gas stations, rice mills, large-scale agriculture and poultry farms, large-scale mining and forestry operations, hotels and resorts must be authorized. Persons proposing any of these activities need to submit an application for environmental authorization to the EPA. Welcome to another episode of the Environmental Protections Agency television program, The Environment Matters, where we take the time to inform you of national development and to sensitize you, the residents of Guyana, on the environmental issues that we continue to face. Ultimately, the goal of this program is to sensitize you on environmental and human development and health. I am your moderator, LaDonna Kisun. This month, our discussion is centered on the topic partnering for development through capacity building. A discussion on the progress made through capacity building with various sister agencies such as the Guyana Police Force, the Neighborhood Democratic Council, or what we would call local government, and also the Guyana Forestry Commission through the EU FLEC project. Partnership and collaboration can go a long way and strengthen relationships between not only sister agencies, but organizations and statutory bodies. At the EPA, we hope that these partnerships not only push our mandate, but also the mandate of these agencies. So in our conversations today, we'll be hearing from a number of representatives from these different organizations on the partnerships that we would have developed. EPA continues to encourage such partnerships with the Guyana Police Force. As of recent, the executive director, along with our legal officers and the commissioner of police, signed on to a memorandum of agreement. Here to tell you a little bit more and give you insight into our partnerships is Commander Budnarain Passad of Region Number 6. Capacity development is very important because looking at our um strategic management plan, we talk about training, infrastructure, partnership, um, professionalism, accountability, um, uh, priority, um, human res uh, resource priority and those things. So um, capacity building is something that, you know, we have been working with our agency and um, I must thank the administration of um, EPA to um, partner with us in um, giving us some, giving my rank some training on um, NICE management. In 2021, the EPA, um, they conducted several NICE management training in Region 6. Um, in excess of 50 ranks from my region, uh, Region 6, benefited from those training. Um, those training would have um, involved like um, the decibel meter reading, um, uh, loudspeaker, definition of loudspeaker, nice disturbances and its effect, um, public event, and how you will manage nice, and different song making devices, and occupational, domestic, environmental um, nice. It explains and, and many other um, little things. Um, it breaks down, you know, and um, so. My ranks, they are in a better position, or they understand more, you know, the effects of NICE and how they should manage. And you know, um, looking at our public, the satisfaction of those who are being disturbed by light, by loud noise. So yes, indeed, it, the, the training um, benefited my ranks tremendously, and I am thankful to the management of EPA. Good. Some of the, well, to start off with nice nuisance, for us, according to our um, law, the Summary Jurisdiction Act um, 174 one, to convict someone for nice nuisance, we have to get statement, we have to be a complainant, you know, attached to that 
but um, how we would go about to get things some when we get this report, many times the callers, um, you know, they won't identify themselves. Um, so we would still attend to the report. Um, one day, persons, the perpetrator, who's ever playing the music to turn off or sometimes slow down, depends on the event and the timings. And if they, you know, if we, if we get a second call, well, then we will, we will move to, you know, um, caution that person and possible charge, providing we get the statement. Um, as it relates to, well, sometimes the noise may, only, may not only come from a, from a, from a stereo set, sometimes persons playing loud music on the road uh, with their vehicles. I know they go to different areas, so um, I just want the general public or the, or the persons who are playing music to know that look, especially the owners of vehicles, um, you cannot be playing your music at the hospital area. Um, maybe there are places of worship, churches, mandirs, masjids. Um, you know, any facility that um, have, um, like children like the orphanage and all those places, you cannot play music there. And then at all after midnight, it will disturb persons. You know, even if you have an event that you are, you are given permission. So the enforcement, um, we do have patrols in all the stations. Like on the quarantine, we have vehicles at Springlands, Number 51, uh, Wim, Rosal, Albion, might be Curie, that's in Black Babush Pula. We have vehicles in all those stations and um, we have a patrol crew. So while patrolling, if they, are not, if they hear any noise, I know in one of the things they are told to check with um, these um, drinking hubs or any social event, whether they're being weddings or what and um, caution them about the music. If permission is given because sometimes persons will seek permission to host wedding houses or birthdays and things, you know. If permission is given, well then it is given under a certain condition that if the thing is, that if the noise is reported by anyone, they need to slow down. And then we do warn them as to how they should play. So those are the measures that I'm using to do the enforcement by my, doing, um, you know, have my patrol. And apart from the patrols I mentioned in the quarantine, I do have patrols also in New Amsterdam, um, which cover the Reliance area and Sisters area. So, and then we also have a special patrol that attend to report that may need some um, urgent, some urgency like serious reports. Well, as a hospital, court, place of worship, you should not be playing your music there. And then still, they may not. Those will are required by law, but then still you have to look at places like orphanage, um, elderly home, and those things. Um, you know you have to be careful. But the one that um, are covered by by law, um, the court, the hospitals, and places of worship. MV and RT um, refer to motor vehicle and road traffic act, but we do charge under section 1741 um, of the summary jurisdiction act 802 for nice nuisance or something, some section 175, depends on what type of music, uh, what type of, of, of noise. And um, when reports, when you receive report on persons, because the, the first of all, the, the noise have to be to the annoyance of someone. Because the charge reads like this, um, play loud and continuous music to the annoyance of John Jones or Terry Singh, whatever. But it has to be the hands of someone. But that doesn't mean that if persons are playing music, you know, and we have a unanimous caller who do not want to be identified, that we won't take action. We will take action to ensure that the, you know, the um, music is stopped. But sometimes we cannot go farther in terms of prosecuting the person because um, of statements. But the police also act as a witness to it in the event that the call comes through. The policeman go to the scene and hear the music playing, you know. He, uh, when in his evidence, he would say, okay, he got this call at X time and then he proceeded to the area and indeed he heard the music playing loud and continuous and, and um, the, from the, 
you know, how loud it was sung and it could have been disturbing the neighborhood. But then it has to be committed against the repo. So the first thing, we have to get someone to come forward, you know, or more than one person. Well, sometimes we go to warning, right? But a lot of calls we are getting from um, persons concerning these vehicles, right? I know it is not coming from higher cars or minibuses because the current over road service. We cannot, um, the higher cars or minibus, they cannot carry loud music, um, certain, just what it came from the makers with, but um, they cannot add amplifying um, system and all those things to the vehicle or loudspeakers. So they would, um, they, we have a restriction against minibuses and higher cars and um, you would hardly find them with that. Sometimes some minibuses take chance indeed and they, they, um, they could be charged with um, breaching the condition of the road service license. That, that, was, that is one the MVNRT talking about. But as it relates to private cars, um, there is no restriction of them carrying the system with them. But then they could be charged for nice nuisance or disturbing public peace if they are playing their music in commercial, you know, um, in residential areas where um, persons um, are disturbed and cannot, you know, do if reports coming in, we could um, take action. And in many cases, the perpetrators could be caught because sometimes person would call and give um, the number of the vehicle and sometimes description of the vehicle. So the police would, um, you know, intervene and sometimes we got them on the spot, sometimes no. But the statement, we get the statement and when we, when we, whenever we get that vehicle, you could um, examine to see whether they have loud music attached to it and it, uh, it will assist the case. But one of the first thing, um, they have a lot of, most of these rum shops are in residential area, right? And um, what I find to see, um, they have the bars, the restaurant and bars, they are more, um, you know, confined or more uh, properly prepared. You have um, enclosement and those things. But these normal rum shop around, they just play their music indiscriminately and the neighbors have to you know um, take that because there is no um, you know there is no blocking off of the music the place is not um, sealed or anything so I would advise that if you cannot seal a place well then you will not be allowed to play music so if you want to entertain your customers with music well then you need to have your place enclosed and sealed or else you will not, you, you know, you could sell, but you cannot be playing any loud music. And sometimes, you know, repeatedly, if a music, even though it is not as big as a, 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 as these um, big two, four bass set, um, you know, if something is playing repeatedly, it become annoying after a time. So still you need to, if you are playing music to the senior customer, right? So long as it's a residential area, you need to, you need to um, enclose your area, right? And um, whether if you get permission or not, you need to control the volume. And there are other things that are also likely to make nice if persons playing um, dominoes late in the night, you know. It would also affect persons because domino is something you would slam it on the table, mm -hmm. you know, or sometimes you're playing pools is um, it's not like a continuous noise. It is more disturbing because you would hear a, a ball hit now and then a couple of seconds after another ball hit and it become, you know, very irritating. So to those persons who, my advice to the persons who are operating these bars, if you need to, if you want to play music, well then enclose the bar because you will be disturbing your neighborhood and then that is when persons would eventually report to the police because they won't be able to take it for too long. Mm -hmm. You have children have to go to school, they have to learn, you have elderly persons who will not be able to manage those nice all the time. You have persons who have to go to work following day and those things. You have persons who have, um, they want to do their prayer, 
afternoon, midday, morning, prayer, whatever it be, and it is very, very disturbing. So you have to be considerate. Be considerate. Um, you have to put yourself in the other person's shoe. You know, tell yourself, look, man, um, if it is happening to me, that the bar is alongside me, and um, this music is playing all the time, you know, how it would impact it negatively on me. So that is one of the things I want the bar owners um, to um, realize. Well, we are getting a lot of reports, and um, from time to time, my patrol would go there, and the same thing because we get any unanimous callers. So we could close them after the night, but then they are not going to court. Persons don't want to report them for whatever reason. So then they are living good. And you know some neighbors, they do not want to make problem with you by taking you to court, you know. But because of, you know, the level of disturbance, they prefer to let the police, um, you know, just give you something to, you know, that they could get some ease. And still the owners of the bar, you know, they sometimes would continue. We have prosecuted 18 persons so far in 2021. And those are persons that where we get um, statements. And some of those persons got a um, two-year ban. Some of them fined. Some of them are spending. And um, EPA, you know, um, they are partnering well with us because um, in some of these same bars where we are getting continuous report, I do contact representative of EPA. I have um, one person named uh, Mr. Tomby, who I would usually call, you know. Um, and in some cases, he would also tell me, you know, so we have the report here, and um, they were warned uh, um, already, and um, we are looking at it, and they were advised. And then also in many cases, EPA already served some notices with slow down things. So, you know, um, we are getting uh, in, uh, better to manage it. The partnership is working because um, our fine is not that hectic, not heavy. Um, you know, you would be paying about ten, ten to $15,000 fine if you are found guilty for a nice nuisance. And, um, but when they, you know, when they, when, when they hear the fine for um, the Environmental Protection Agency, when they charge you under their act, you could pay up to three to five hundred thousand dollars fine, you know. It um, deter them from doing certain things, and then if EPA need our assistance when they are executing the duty, right? We are there. We are there to send officers if they need, and at the same time, if I need EPA assistance in terms of advice and partnering, like there's a particular bar, um, I wouldn't call name in, um, in, in the upper quarantine area, that um, you know, we, we uh, um, a few complaints came in and I um, talked to the representative and EP and jointly we, we worked together and did something. And um, much complaints not coming, you know, from that bar, but um, there is some, some level of restriction. So the partnership is working, and as I told before, my ranks also, what I, if I am sharing my success story, I must say that um, those training from EPA, you know, because they break it down in about, you know, in about 40 different um, paragraphs with different headings as to, you know, this is what and this is what. So the ranks, they are better, you know, and um, understanding, um, what is nice disturbances, right? As it relates to public health and all those things, because it could um, take your ear after a time and um, the way they put it over and thing. And um, having a, even though I was not here at the time when the training was done, um, having you know interaction with them as it relates to their training. Um, yes, indeed, they welcome it. Um, they welcome the training from EPA. And we will continue to work closer, or I expect EPA to continue to, to do more of such so that my ranks will be better equipped. One of the challenges that, um, you know, we, we don't charge under the EPA Act, and at the same time, we 
we don't have the decibel meters and um, most of the reports coming to us because we have most of these reports coming in the night and that is when the office of DPL we close and we are always there to address reports. So, um, and then sometimes measuring song is why we think, you know, you would need to prove in certain situation. So decibel meters is something that see that, um, you know, in future we will need it since as we are having the training so that we could better manage, um, you know, nice nuisance. Yes, I would say that. I would say that, and the staff of EPL are very, very cooperative. And we are working along, it's not like a, um, who, who is more powerful and who is not more powerful in that time. Right? We are working along well. They have different ways in doing things because they would go more into nice, like um, generator making nice, a sawmiller making nice, um, consistent nice from a particular bar or area, you know, and then um, they would warn for us and sort of notices and those things, they operate a little bit different, but effectively. And then, um, as I told you before, if they need our assistance in executing the duty, I am always here. But um, I have never got a complaint that we hear anyone try to, um, you know, oppose a, a EPA um, officer in executing his duty. But if it ever happened, we are here, they request our presence. Well, um, the same bars, but uh, I would say on the quarantine, the reports are more prevalent, right? And I suppose this is a challenge indeed because I wouldn't run, they wouldn't um, I would say, well, I have it on, or I would continuously instruct, nice nuisance for me is zero tolerance. But then um, one person to understand the word zero tolerance out there, zero tolerance doesn't mean to say that the person have to be locked up. Because sometimes when persons making report, they expect the police to carry them and lock them up the whole day and release them in the morning. It's not over when so lock up. Zero tolerance is in terms of charges. So, but what give us, what the, the challenge is persons are not coming forward to give the statement. And because of how the offense has been constituted, you know, and what is required in court, you have to get these statements. And because of persons don't want to live bad with their neighbors or don't want to create, you know, they don't want to bad face with someone, they would refrain from giving those statements. But for the persons who are making those nice, I'm calling on you. You know, you need to be your brother's keeper. You need to understand other person's feelings you need to look around you and see how many others will be disturbed whenever you are enjoying yourself, you know. Persons could, um, you know, if you have a function. And hardly you will find persons complaining when you have a one hour function, like if a neighborhood, someone have a wedding or a birthday and thing. You, 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 you would get called, like if it is exceeding after the midnight hours, but not before. Right, because they realize that look, this is a one them entertainment. Somebody have the child um, that they are marrying, and um, and they want to have a nice time. But the regular is coming from vehicles. Persons who just decide to take a, a drink and turn up their music hard, um, and in some cases also, many cases also, um, neighbors are not in speaking terms. Right. And you will find that some of the, uh, at some time the music are not that loud, but the reports are still coming in. But then we are in no position to judge that because of the decibel mm -hmm. song, right? So Nigeria is a challenge, but we are getting there. And with the EPA fine, you know, it, it, it is. Um, telling an impact on the on those who are playing at the um, you know at, at the rum shops and the and the bars and those things. Well at the restaurant and bar it still remain at two o'clock but it 
those are enclosed bars we're talking about, you know. And if a person would apply to play music at wedding houses and those things, it's happening all the time. And we don't program them beyond 12 o'clock. And then under condition that if the music is disturbing to the, the, the neighborhood, then they will have to slow it down or turn it off, even though they are giving permission. Because they have clause covering that in the permission letter. Oh, I think um, that is all I could say about about nice But um, thank you for coming and um, to the administration of EPA. Um, I will welcome more training for my ranks and more um, what do you call it um, flyers or pamphlet or reading material that you know could um, educate them more. Big, big campaign with them police officers, so shutting down them people, barbecue, wedding, dance. Man, how oh y'all yeah, expect these people to make money and survive? Oh, Miss Cheryl, that is far from the truth. The EPA and the Guyana Police Force are actually working together to ensure that persons who conduct certain businesses and activities are authorized. We've tried to allow them to adhere to the noise regulations. Well, this is going to be a new law. What law is this? These laws were always in place. It's now that we're getting all these complaints at the agency, we are trying to enforce them. The Environmental Protection Act has been in place since 1996, and it states that persons and businesses must apply for environmental authorization before operating a sound making device. Well, girl, I never know this thing is prior to the law. So if you're keeping a barbecue or an open air function, like a wedding or a concert, especially in your community, Right? I am playing a music system, you have to apply for a short-term noise permit. And for persons that operate in a business and you got generators and stuff, you have to apply for a long-term permit. And that is applicable to bars and hotspots and clubs also. Well, now that you explain it, I understand it. It's unfair to the elderly, sick people, and even them little children. That is correct. According to the World Health Organization, loud noise can cause stress, sleep deprivation and hearing impairment and I sure you wouldn't want that. Oh, now I understand. Thank you for explaining it, Miss Sonia. For more information, you can contact the EPA at 225-5471 or visit our office at Ganji Street, North Sophia, Georgetown. At the Environmental Protection Agency, we believe that the environment is everybody's business. We can start caring for our planet by becoming more environmentally friendly in our everyday actions. Here's what you can do. Dispose of waste in a garbage bin. Clean our drains, yards, and carpets regularly. Take a reusable shopping bag to the market. Support local butchers and farmers to reduce packaged waste. Plant a kitchen garden, trees, and flowers. Compost your organic waste. Conserve water and electricity. Carry a reusable water bottle. These little acts are good for your health and that of the environment. Remember, healthy people work better and achieve more, and together, small actions make a big difference. For further information on how you can help, please contact the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Ganji Street, Sophia, or telephone us at 225-5467. You can also visit our website, epagana.org, or our Facebook and Instagram pages. Do you have an environmental complaint? Then the Environmental Protection Agency wishes to advise that you can report an environmental complaint at the agency 
via one of the following. You can call our 24-hour hotline number at 225-5469 or you can drop us an email at complaints at epaguyana.org or you can message us on our Facebook page at EPA Guyana or you can message us directly on Instagram at EPA GY. Please note, when submitting an environmental complaint, you would need to submit the following. Name of complainant, that is the person who is making the complaint, the address of that person, a contact number, as well as the alleged polluter, a name for them, or a name of their business, their location, and the nature of the complaint. For further information, you can visit our agency's head office at Ganji Street, Sophia, or you can visit one of the regional offices to make your environmental complaint. You can visit our WIM office in the quarantine or our Linden office in the Lynn Building, Mackenzie, Linden. Please note that all information collected from the public will be treated with the strictest confidence. However, complainants should be willing to attend court and testify should the matter require legal action. has developed a complaint strategy to effectively address the large volume of complaints that we have been receiving. The goal to investigate complaints related to the breaches of the Environmental Protection Act and our subsidiary regulations is to deliver actions that meet effective outcomes. In this regard, the agency has been engaging relevant authorities who also have similar mandates such as ours to ensure the effective management of complaints. We have been working with the neighborhood democratic councils around Guyana. During these consultations, it was recognized that capacity building was needed within these local organs in order to address and efficiently address environmental complaints within these jurisdictions. In this regard, six capacity development trainings on managing environmental complaints were previously conducted in regions 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 10. Chairman of the Better Hope LBI Neighborhood Democratic Council, Mr. Sheikh Shamshir, has been one of those many persons who would have gone through this training. So today, he will tell us a little bit about his experience. So welcome to our program, Mr. Shamshir. I hope that you have been keeping well. I, I am keeping well. And thank you for having me on the program. It's a pleasure. All right, so we know that you would have um, been engaging with the EPA even prior to our complaint strategy being developed and our capacity building with the NDC. Um, so could you just tell us what are some of the most common environmental issues um, that you would have faced as a chairman um, within your NDC and as a part of the local government? The most challenging ones we have so far to date was is the, um, the auto body repair shops mm -hmm. where they spray the cars in open air and this affects the resident, the surrounding residents. And then on top of that, we have our, um, the furniture shops, which practice the same way. Everything is open air. They saw, they spray everything. Um, the third one might not be the last one, but we have the garbage, illegal dumping of mm -hmm. garbage and burning of garbage. So those are the major ones that affect our NDC. And it's take us every day in the field. It's actually bring us out every day in the field to deal with this. 
so we do know that these are um, issues that um, not just your NDC, but NDCs across Guyana face. And they continue to be an issue because ever so often you find these little shops pop up here and there. Um, so how has the training that you would have gone through or you, you and your other council members would have gone through, how has it better equipped um, you, um, your organ, to effectively manage or address these complaints that come from these workshops and um, repair shops around your area? Right, so with the training we had with EPA that happened a few months ago, um, we were able to work in sync with EPA regulations and we take some of that training with us into the field. And what makes us better was that we had a lot of operators present at that meeting. Mm -hmm. So most of those operators present were following the rules or fall into line with the training that was given. So whenever we get into the field, we would walk with some of the brochures that you guys gave us. We would share it with the residents and all the counselors within our NDCs were given copies of those brochures. So every one of us are equipped with the information needed mm -hmm. when we visit these locations. All right. So if we're to complain, uh, comp here, sorry. If we're to compare the system um, that you were working under um, to changes that you would have implemented following the training, what would you say would have been some of the changes that you would have made? Well, the escaping of the fumes from the spring, mm -hmm. which is a major concern for me personally, um, that get into the environment that causes a lot of health issues. And that was something that I will, before the training, I will reach out to EPA to see what can be done or whatever agency that we could get help from. And I was very happy that the EPA was very cooperative with myself and the council in solving a lot of these problems. Okay, perfect. So I'm very happy that we are <laughs> able to continue to work together. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, like I said, I know that you are one of those um, chairmen that calls us. We follow up on right. um, issues that are related to your community. And, you know, we work together, especially when we have field inspections to do. Um, but outside of working with us, uh, the local government itself, how have you been involving residents um you know through education and awareness um but more so particularly on environmental issues um that you face from like you mentioned your auto body workshops your furniture workshops and things like that so we haven't had much community outreach in mm -hmm. in a large scale but what we do when we visit an area we tend to traverse the streets back and forth see who's mm -hmm. affected me the residents here what's bothering them and the operators, we always encourage them to be conscious of the neighbors surrounding you, you know, because your operation should not affect mm -hmm. the residents immediate next to you. I am all for that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I'm all for that. We could all, I, I always say, you know, we can all just live in harmony. In harmony. Yes, we yeah. can all live in harmony. And just few communications and, mm -hmm. and concerns for each other. Yes that's it we right. just need to communicate um, and communicate in a respectful manner Correct. and be considerate of each other all right so um just to address what are some of the collaborations that you look forward to with regards to engagements with epa well the the first engagement we had with epa was for the uh was the the meeting with the mm -hmm. vendors and the operators and the, some of the counselors. And I think this training should be ongoing as there's new operators coming on board. And with the EPA together with the NDC, it sends a stronger message to the operator. And I would like for us to continue working together because I believe the NDC is the first step towards establishing a business. So once we can work together, you can actually refer them back to the NDC to be compliant, which is building mm -hmm. plans and regulations, compliance with GRE, NIS, and everything, so to bring them in line with everything else. Perfect. Yeah. All right, so if you were to leave a message, um, not only uh, for the area mm -hmm. that you are responsible for, which is our Better Hope LBI um, Neighborhood Council, 
uh, but in general, what would you say to persons listening to our program today? Well, to the residents, I would like to say to the residents, if there's an operator who is causing discomfort to you, don't be afraid to come forward. Reach out to us. We can help you. Just, you can be anonymous. And to the operators, I would like to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. To the operator, I would like to tell them, you're a businessman. I know some of these guys get up in the morning and just go and buy a couple of pieces of equipment and decide they can start work the next day. Mm -hmm. But there's a system they need to follow. And they should do a study of the area to see if their business can fit within that area. Mm -hmm. You know, because they got to be conscious of their neighbors. And because you got elderly people, sick people, and mm -hmm. in some of these um, areas, we have elderly folks who have medical condition. I mean, you take all these things into consideration. That's most certain. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Shamshir, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. Um, it was a pleasure talking with you, Same and way. I do look forward to our continuous working relationship. I will be happy to be part of it. Thank, thank you, so you so much. much. Thank you. All right, so we will be right back with the Environment Matters. At the Environmental Protection Agency, we believe that the environment is everybody's business. We can start caring for our planet by becoming more environmentally friendly in our everyday actions. Here's what you can do. Dispose of waste in a garbage bin, Clean our drains, yards, and carpets regularly. Take a reusable shopping bag to the market. Support local butchers and farmers to reduce packaged waste. Plant a kitchen garden, trees, and flowers. Compost your organic waste. Conserve water and electricity. Carry a reusable water bottle. These little acts are good for your health and that of the environment. Remember, healthy people work better and achieve more, and together, small actions make a big difference. For further information on how you can help, please contact the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Ganji Street, Sophia, or telephone us at 225-5467. You can also visit our website, epagana.org, or our Facebook and Instagram pages. Attention all miners. Mining is important to Ghana's development, and so is our biodiversity. Practice smart mining. Use a retort. Dispose of your waste properly, manage your tailings well, and reclaim mined out areas. Remember, improper mining is a threat to your health, biodiversity, and a hindrance to prosperity. A message from the Environmental Protection Agency and Ministry of Natural Resources, with funding from JEP through the United Nations Development Program. this month's feature of the environment matters as i mentioned at the beginning of the program we will now be chatting with the guyana forestry commission rep on the eu forest law enforcement governance and trade program now forest covers approximately 85 percent of guyana and fourth fifth of that vegetation is classified as state forests now, forest is not just a source for timber, but it also is used as a sustenance for the people of Guyana, primarily in rural and forested communities where the Amerindians dwell. There are multiple uses for our forest, which includes our social cultural services, and it also plays an integral part into pro in providing food and medicine. It is also an essential natural resource which contributes to Guyana's economy. The management of our state forests remains the responsibility of the Guyana Forestry Commission. 
So let's welcome Mr. Kenny Davids, who will be chatting with us on the EAU Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade Program. So welcome to our program, Kenny. Thanks, thanks for having me, Ladana. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit on the EU FLEG program with our viewers today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule because I know you're very, a very busy person <laughs> sure. and there's a lot happening. All right, so let's get right into what is what exactly is the EU FLEG VPA and what does it mean to Guyana particularly? So the EU FLECT uh, VPA really is it's a trade agreement um, and was birthed um, you know, with the EU um, and it was birthed out of, out of a need um, for the reduction in illegal, illegal logging and illegal timber coming into the EU market. Uh, and so what the EU uh, decided in its action plan is to be able to have an arrangement with producer countries like Guyana to ensure that the timber that we are, we are exporting to those countries um, you know, is it's it's legal, and that ver that legality can be proven in that sense. So when the timber arrives to the market, um, so for Guyana, what it really um, allows us to do is to be able to for, you know tap into a market, but also to say to that market, we we are bringing legal timber to your you know to that marketplace. Okay, so how exactly does this entire process um, came into existence? Did you guys notice that there was? A lot of illegal trade with timber. Actually, it, it, it's it's interesting, but it was it was more. I think I think you know there's. I don't, I don't think there'll probably ever be a case where there's never illegal. There's no illegal <laughs> timber, but I think um, it was more from the EU side because the EU is a pretty large market, and because of the volumes of timber that was coming into the EU, they recognized that as long as there's a market for illegal timber, in that sense. You know, people are going to produce in that sense, or or whatever means they use to get the timber, uh, and so from the in the action plan, um, you know, they decided that we we still want to buy your timber, mm -hmm. but we have to ensure that you're bringing legal timber to us, um, and so, but for countries like Guyana, uh, you know, for us it's like you know it, it made sense I think to go down the road of of, of getting involved in the in the VPA, uh, because again the market is is quite large. Um, and we are, you know, pretty confident that we could, um, with the system that we already have, but and whatever changes may be needed, we could ensure that our stakeholders and the systems that are in place mm -hmm. can meet or match that level that is required, uh, you know, at the at the at the at the, at the EU uh, market. Okay, perfect. So I'm very happy that you made mention of the VPA. So just tell us what exactly does VPA mean? Oh, sorry. The, the VPA, <laughs> the, the vol it, it stands for Voluntary Partnership Agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the EU said was, you know, we want to have an agreement with countries um, that want to bring timber, but we can't, uh, we're not going to force this agreement upon anybody. And so it is for you as a country to meet with your stakeholders. Uh, and make a decision, do you want to go down the road of a VPA? Uh, and so one of the first things we did was meet with our stakeholders. And this, so this process is very stakeholder driven. And uh, once we would have spoken to our stakeholders, um, and it was a pretty resounding yes, that yes, we want to do this, it makes sense. Um, and so it's it voluntary in the sense that we made a decision to go ahead with it, but of course, once you get to the stage of the agreement, then it becomes, uh, it becomes law in that sense. You don't have to comply with what you have captured within that agreement. All right. So we know it's um, compliance can be a difficult thing um, here in Guyana and around the world in general. Sure. So what would you say are some of the benefits of um, the VPA program? I, I think, um, I mean, you're right. Compliance is, is difficult. One of the things um, for us is we, we're, we're building you know, um, the system or trying to tap into the EU market, but we're building on our existing systems. Mm -hmm. So, but I think um, from a very general perspective, certainly the market is, is going to be a, a huge benefit. Um, to be able to access um, a market that uh, can pretty much take all the timber we can produce, um, I, I think that is probably the, the, the largest benefit. But, but for us as well, it was to be able to improve our systems because we saw an opportunity to be able to, to do what we do and do it better. Um, and, and by that I mean, so, you know, things like technology, how, how do we improve on technology? How do we, even the tracking system that we have in place, can we make it better? Can we get our stakeholders, you know, capacity to be built? Information sharing can happen a, a lot smoother. Uh, and, and so and so for us, it, it's, it's, you know, just as a whole, you know, to do the business of forestry a lot more efficiently. 
you know, whether or not we were going to the EU market. And I think that, that was also what we saw. It wasn't just an opportunity to be able to tap into that market. But by improving the system at the national level, we were also saying to every other market that the timber we bring to your market as well is legal and, and that le and the le you know, legality can be proven and verified. Perfect. So with all of that being said, and, you know, this being a program that's being run right here in Guyana, how does the VPA more so supports Guyana's LCDS? Well, the, the I mean, the, the LCDS, um, I mean, it's, it's low carbon and, de you know, development that, has as, as small an impact in you know in terms of as we say carbon footprint as possible. Um, so while development happens, it has to be sustainable. Um, and one of the things you recognize is, you know, if when illegal logging happens, a lot of forest degradation happens because, mm -hmm. as as you would imagine, if if someone is going to cut some logs, you know, illegally, they're not going to follow any rules. They're going to go to an area because um, you, you may or may not know we do you know we do sustainable harvesting, mm -hmm. and so once a once a certain volume has been extracted from a particular area, mm -hmm. that area has to remain um, untouched for a certain time to allow for regeneration. But if an illegal logger goes in there, what what he or she does is you know they're going to just cut what they want and they're going to leave. So the forest gets degraded, and so ultimately what is happening is that sort of sequestration um, function the forest performs is going to be weakened. So we had to so so we saw it also. So the VPA is saying we can track timber, we can trace it more effectively, more efficiently. We have better systems in place. So ultimately, we are ensuring what is done is done legally. Forests that should be standing are standing and ultimately supporting that process. Mm -hmm. But I think also, you know, what illegal logging does is, you know, those monies th that should be going to the people that are actually doing legal logging, you know, sometimes it's not going to them. And ultimately they have to cut more to get what they're actually looking for because some of the what they want has been has been already removed illegally uh, and so it really is quite supportive of the, of the lcds okay. process because it's really adding to that to that larger you know hole in that sense okay and i know that's exactly what we're intended to do to ensure that um our sustainable management ties into other projects absolutely. that we are undertaking absolutely all right so i know the guyana timber legality Assurance system. Those, this is a bit those long, some sorry. really long abbreviations. Yeah. Yes. So the Guyana Timber Legality Assurance System is more so the heart of the VPA. Right. So just describe to us exactly what is that system, um, and why is compliance so important. So, the the Timber Legality Assurance System. Well, we actually say the GT Las um, for short. <laughs> so we don't. It's, it's it's quite a lengthy abbreviation. You're right. Um, but but really what it is is you know you, you you sort of you know for someone that is buying timber you know what it, it's essentially that system that says what are all the things that need to be checked on our end so that when you get when timber arrives in the EU or any other market that all the boxes have been ticked mm -hmm. so in, in a sense what it's doing is looking is it it captured within that system it are all the relevant approvals and compliances that need to be had so for example you know if you are if you you know if you're going to cut from a particular concession you know was that concession approved mm -hmm. if you're removing timber did you have the relevant paperwork in place but in addition to that you know if you are you have to be compliant with EPA, for example, EPA has its requirements, or the NIS has requirements. Did you, you know, did you do what was supposed to be done? Are you compliant with those? So what the TLAS system is, is really a, a system that, as the name suggests, it assures legality. Mm -hmm. But behind that system has all these checks and balances that has to be, that has to be, you know, you have to follow to ensure that, yes, I have checked all the boxes and now the timber that is coming to you is, is, is legal. Perfect. And I know, um, we are at a point now where we are ensuring that we educate persons um, and build capacity sure. um, through community development. So could you say why it's so important that we do these capacity developments to ensure compliance? Um, I, I think one of the things we have seen um, you know, at, at the GFC is that a lot of times non-compliance is um, are as a result of, of either misinformation or, or, or no information. Um, uh, and, and, and sometimes people just, they need to be educated in terms of, of you know, because many times documentation um, can be a challenge, um, simply understanding what is being asked of them from a particular agency. Mm -hmm. And so we recognize that if we want compliance, we just can't sort of stand back and say, you need to comply. Mm -hmm. But how can we help you comply? 
Um, and I think a big part of it is ensuring that you have the understanding, you have the capacity uh, within your group, within your, your village, your community, your, your concession to say, yes, I understand what compliance means for me. So if, if I have to pay, for example, taxes, what do I have to pay? Why do I have to pay? What am I, you know, what do I have to pay? Where do I make the relevant payments? So it's like, you know, there is, there is, a, there is a need. So at the end of it, you're complying with what the requirements are, you know, we believe is going to be a lot easier. First of all, you understand why. Because I think a lot of times, um, you know, people don't quite understand why a particular thing is being required of them. So, you know, you may, you may have someone say, well, you're bringing all these regulations or you're bringing FLEC to us, but why? And sometimes the why needs to be very, very clear. Uh, and then once we've told you why, so okay, then what do you need to do? Where do I sign? What information do I have to provide to you on a monthly, on a weekly, on an annual basis um, to be able to say, yes, I am continually compliant in that sense. Yeah. And I completely agree with you. Um, I usually say to persons, you know, when I give you this information, what you do, it is, it's completely up to you, but I will not be accountable because yeah. Yeah. I would have given you that yeah. information. Yeah. Um, Previously, you would have mentioned your, you know, partnerships with uh, entities or agencies such as NIS. Um, and I know EPA, and you did speak on this, EPA has been partnering with the Guyana Forestry yeah. Commission on this particular project. So what are some of the benefits you've seen um, through our partnerships? Um, I think, I think you know, it's actually, I think it's, it's quite wonderful that being able to partner with, with agencies like, like the EPA. I think... First and foremost, it's certainly, you know, the resources to, to do what we do under the, the EU Flex EPA, it, it's, it's limited. And, 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 and I, I'm guessing for the EPA, there's not, you know, it's like a never ending <laughs> supply of resources. And I think for that, for that, for that reason, as, um, for one of the reasons, I think it's, it's really good that we can actually partner. So it means that when we go to stakeholders, um, because of how connected, you know, what the EPA does and, and what, what forestry does. And I think sometimes, again, you know, so it's, it's one being able to, to make better use of the resources. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going, uh, it, it means simply making a seat available for somebody else from the from from the EP or the NIS. Um, but all the other, because people are going to be there anyway. We're inviting them to a particular location. They're going to be there. We might as well make the best use of the time we have with them. Um, but I think also what I, what what we have found that I think is really good is people people are able to connect the dots mm -hmm. um, because often what will happen is. If, when you talk to people in, in silos or separately, what you find is sometimes someone may hear EPA or they may hear NIS and they don't quite understand what it has to do with forestry. Yeah. And I think that that connection is really, really good um, and, and quite helpful. But, but I think also for us at, at, the, at the Forestry Commission or even the other agencies, it helps us to understand as well. So even, you know, my knowledge of why EPA and what it's doing and, and you know, as much as the people are learning, we are learning because I'm hearing and I'm yes. listening to, the, to, to, you know, to the staff present and, and, and feel the, the various questions. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's been amazing to see, you know, what that collaboration has, has, has been doing because it's certainly not just with the EPA. Um, but I think it really helps, and I think I think collaborating as well um, kind of gives you a, a first-hand uh, opportunity to also understand the challenges stakeholders are having because you're there, and they'll say to you, you know, what we what we struggle with is this, and then you, but then you you then are able to understand, okay, even at forestry, and what can we do to help? Because it may not, it, it may be we can we can support another agency in another way, but we just didn't think about it until somebody on the ground says to you, well. Why don't you do this? So that, that kind of feedback is, I think, extremely critical for all of us that are involved in the process. Most definitely. Um, one of the things I am really intrigued with from time to time is that engagement with persons. As long as you're there and present, they know not just only understand what exactly it is that you're doing, but you get to better understand what is it that they expect from you. Yeah, and absolutely. you're able to bridge those gaps that would have been created because of miscommunication True. or because they just did not understand the system from the beginning. Right. All right. So with all that is happening with um, VPA, um, with GFC, with EPA, what are the next steps um, for the VPA program, um, and do you guys have a timeline? Um, yeah, it's 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 it's. <laughs> well, while it's not it's not a difficult question, I think I think sometimes what ha um, I smile because because what happens you know when we first started this process, I think 
I think, you know, what we said to stakeholders or what I think the expectations were, I think sometimes you have to really manage expectations. You know, the expectation was that it would probably take us, let's say, five years to from start from when we said, yes, we would like to go down the road of a VPA to the end. And now we're probably eight, nine years in um, or even more. And I blame Corona for half of the, <laughs> half of the gaps that have been created uh, with regards to getting work done and timelines. I blame Corona. <laughs> well, I think why we yeah why we probably can put a small blame to to, to, to what the virus has done and still is doing in some regards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think once we once you once you sort of get into programs like these and you realize that so many different stakeholders and everybody has their own views and what people actually want, it's not it's not always very easy to have consensus. Uh, also, I think that you know the resources um, it takes a lot of resources to, be able to do what yes, we it do. Does. And when you know to meet every stakeholder, to hear every voice, and to give them a chance to be heard, um, and to also you know take the message, because again, the VP can be quite complex, mm -hmm. you know, and so sometimes just taking the time to simplify that message. And sometimes I think we still we still we still don't get it as as right as we should, mm -hmm. but you know, and to simplify that message and and to do it in a way um, that people really understand and can give you the kind of feedback you need, so that you're proud of the agreement. Uh, in 2018, we actually um, initialed the VPA, and, and really what that signaled to the EU was that we were, um, you know, what was continuing the agreement, we were more or less happy with. Um, but from 2018 to now, we've been going through what we call um, legal scrubbing. We've been vetting the document. Um, but what also needed to happen is it had to be also translated into, uh, I think it is 24, 25 different languages in the EU. So that every member state of the EU, so, so while we saw it in English, it had to be translated into all these languages so that they would understand what was contained therein and are they happy with it. Uh, so in fact, we, are, we've just, we were just discussing earlier today that um, a signature is likely to happen for the VPA um, sometime in November of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, once we're able to sign, then there is still the, the ratification process which says that, um, you know, it is now, as a country, you're now sort of, you know, it's now you're sort of mandated to do what is contained within the agreement. Mm -hmm. um, what what I think has been what has worked for us though is that even though we were supposed to start implementing what's under the VPA in uh, once we have ratified with the EP with the EU, we were able to to come to an agreement where we could start implementation once both sides were happy with what was in the agreement. So we've actually started implementation um, about a little over a year ago. Uh, and so we're just going to continue that. The hope is that, of course, by the end of this year, we can uh, we could ha have the document signed, and very in the first quarter of next year ratified. Um, it's difficult to say how long it'll take before you know we actually have flex licenses, we actually yeah. issue licenses. But um, and I think it has to do with so much with stakeholders. Um, again, agencies like the EPA. And there's at least 16 other agencies that are involved. So it's, it's quite a task to mm -hmm. have all agencies. And I think I think you know it's important for, for, for people to understand those agencies have their own challenges as well. Mm -hmm. You know, by no means does any one of them have all the resources they need. We're getting there. It will take time. Um, but our, our hope is that um, you know the hope is that as we improve the system, though, you don't wait until the end to start getting the benefits. So, for example, I mentioned technology and, and, and the rate at which information is captured and shared between stakeholders and agencies. And those little steps we're counting on to improve, or we we, we improve uh, processing operations. Those little things being pluses along the way until such time as we have a, a, a you can issue flex licenses. Correct, okay, and I'm very happy that you mentioned on the point of it takes time yes, it, it takes does. time i i yeah. do not understand why people have this perception that you know we can roll over and problems <laughs> and issues can be fixed yeah. right away yeah. it takes time um and we don't just have to look at the time factor but we also have to look at the availability of resources absolutely but yeah. we are getting there and that is what is important yes. all right kenny so as we close is there a message that you'd like to leave with our forest operators who are actually viewing this program um i think i think um what i would want to say to forest operators is you know i mean let us work together i, I believe that uh you know we're at a stage where and i think it's important for for, for, for stakeholders to understand that you know the direction we're moving in in terms of sustainability and traceability the world is moving in that direction. I think too often persons view us as though we're, we're bringing to them 
a whole host of things that is so difficult mm-hmm. to comply with. Mm-hmm. But no, we are living in a world where sustainability and sustainable forest management is so key that unless you are there, certain markets you can't access anymore. So all I, all I really want to say to stakeholders is we are going to work with you. We're not going to throw you out there and say, let's see if you can swim. It is we're going to work with you until such time, but we'd like really like that support to be both ways. So as we work with you, you work with us. And I think we can we can you know we can all achieve what we're what we really would like to under this uh, this particular agreement. Most definitely. And on that note, I would like to thank you, our viewers, for staying tuned with us for this month's feature of the Environment Matters. I hope that you have been inspired to not only share Kenny's message, but to share all the information that you would have heard on this feature, which includes all matters of environmental complaints such as noise pollution. Remember, together we can resolve these problems and restore Earth to its natural being. This has been the Environment Matters. I have been your moderator, LaDonna Kisun. Remember, this program is rebroadcasted right here on NCN. For any additional information, you can make contact with the Environmental Protection Agencies on any of our numbers listed here right in Georgetown, Burbies, or WIM office, or our office at Mackenzie linden continue to follow us on facebook and on instagram and you can also look at this program on our youtube channel that's epa guyana thank you so much guyana for staying with us stay safe until next time